Okay, and welcome to Unit 2, Lesson 1. Today we're talking about geology. Um, we're going to do kind of an overview of geology, and then in future lessons we're going to go deeper into each topic. So let's just jump in. All right, the word geology. Right, we all know it's kind of has something to do with rocks and stuff, but let's see if we can understand what that means. Geo is the word for earth, right? Like geography, right? And geology, those have the same root. And then logi or logic, biology, just means study of. So we've got the study of earth, and that's what geology is. And it's part of the bigger group of life science, of earth sciences. So um, we could also be talking about atmosphere or the oceans or weather, or anything like that. But what we're going to do in this unit is we're going to talk about Earth itself. We're going to kind of ignore the water for the most part, ignore the air for the most part, and just talk about the Earth, um, kind of the dirt and the rocks and that kind of stuff. All right. So here we got a cross section of our planet. And you can see that there are layers, right? Like a parfait. It's got layers. And um, you guys are going to be responsible for knowing some of these layers and a few descriptors of them. And we'll get into that a little bit more um, in the next few days, but we're going to kind of start with an overview. So we've got the crust right up at the top, right? So you and I, we live on the crust, and right below us is the mantle. Now that mantle, we always say it is fluid. It can move, right? And when I say fluid, it's actually not any more fluid than like concrete. But um, with all the weight of the earth and the heat and everything like that, it actually does move around quite a bit. Below that, we've got our outer core, and that is liquid. That's molten metals. And below that, we've got our solid metal inner core. All right? So we've got kind of the crust, which is where we live, and then the plastic mantle. And then we've got the fluid outer core. And in the center, we've got that solid um, iron core. Um, so, the Earth is changing, right? And we need to have an idea about um, how it changes. So the Earth changes in two big ways. The Earth changes by things moving, continents moving, right? Australia, Africa, Europe, all these things are moving around. Uh, now, they're not moving very fast. They're moving at about the same speed that your fingernails grow, right? See, so that gives you a kind of a picture of it. But they are moving, and the Earth didn't always look the way it does today. And the other way that things are changing is the rock cycle, which is how we convert one type of rock to another type of rock. So, for example, there could be a black, heavy, really hard rock called basalt, right? And that basalt can get weathered down and turn into something like sand. And that sand can become something like sandstone, which is that soft... Um, grainy rock that you can break in your hands and that sandstone could even get converted back into lava and become something kind of like the basalt that it started out as. So there's this cycle where rocks change and they change so incredibly um, uh, they change so much that it's really something to see. Um, so we mentioned the Earth's crust a little bit before and, and something to get, keep in mind is that the Earth's crust is really really small Right? And like we got this picture here of a tomato. The Earth's crust is like the skin of the tomato. Right? The mantle and the core make up the rest of it. And that Earth's crust is just so small. And that's where we live. That's where all these rocks that we talk about live. Um, so we've got three types of rocks. Igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic. All right? And we're going to go and have a little overview of each of those types. Igneous rocks. Well, igneous means formed by fire. Right, you can hear the word ignite in there, um, and and that kind of thing. So we've got formed by fire, which means that these rocks come from lava or they come from magma. Right, molten rocks either below the surface, that would be the magma, or above the surface, which would be the lava. Um, and this is really almost all of the Earth's crust is these igneous rocks. Now up in the corner, you can see a couple examples. You might recognize the square-looking picture. Um, because that's your granite countertops. There's another piece of granite next to it. And then below that, we've got some uh, different igneous rock. And actually, we have a sample of that we're going to pass, a, pass around um, sometime this week. Um, but all three of these rocks are igneous rocks. So the countertops you've got at home are igneous rocks. And then we're going we're gonna to handle some samples here in the future. 
Um, so, are there any igneous rocks in Costa Rica? Well, of course. I mean, we've got like we've got all those volcanoes and everything like that. So we definitely do. Next, we've got our sedimentary rocks. Um, now, these are formed from weathered materials or sediments, right? So things like the igneous rocks, they break down. There's water. There's wind. There's um, freezing, all those things break down the rocks, and then from those little bits, they can get compacted and form new rocks, and those are called sedimentary rocks. These are the most common rocks on the uppermost crust, meaning the, these are the most common rocks that you see every day. Below the uppermost crust, kind of, you got a shovel out, then you hit a lot of the igneous rocks. Um, Two-thirds of the Earth's surface. I mean, this is just really incredible. So here below in the pictures, we've got some sandstone on the left, which is just so soft, you can, you can play with it. And there's some shale in the center. Um, that, is a, that is a really interesting one, because when you hit it, it breaks off in these layers. It's beautiful. And we've got some beautiful limestone also in the picture. All right, metamorphic rock. Now, this is the, this is the third and final type of rock. So... Meta means after, right? And morph, right, means change. So this is after the change. So these are these metamorphic rocks, they're not formed this way from the beginning. You have to take other rocks and make metamorphic rocks. All right? So you take some other rock and you put it in high pressure and high temperature underneath the earth, and that pressure and temperature will reshape the rock, changes it, and you get an entirely different kind of rock. So marble is one of the most incredible examples of this. Granite is an igneous rock that's like on your countertop. Marble is what's in the statues, like the beautiful statue of David or um, some of those famous statues like Venus de Milo. Those are all granite statues. I'm sorry, marble statues. And you can take granite and take lots of heat, lots of pressure, and you can make marble. And that change is really amazing because, you know, imagine you took um, a knife and a chisel to your granite countertop. Do you think you could make David? You probably wouldn't be able to. Um, it's just the wrong rock for that. But with lots of heat and pressure, you can transform, you can metamorph that rock from granite into marble. Pretty amazing. All right, um, so we're going to talk about minerals. Minerals are what rocks are made out of, right? So you are a person, you're made out of organs. You've got a heart and a liver and everything like that. Well, minerals are what rocks are made out of. So marble right, would have some minerals that compose it, right? So they might have a little bit of quartz or something like that, and that would be a mineral that's making up some of the marble. Um, natural, normally they're inorganic crystalline solids, which means they don't have a lot of carbon, but they're everything else in the periodic table, and they've got specific chemical compositions. Um, some minerals are made out of several different kinds of atoms. So you could have carbonates, which is carbon and oxygen bound together, and that could be a mineral. But then you've got other minerals that are just pure elements, kind of like gold, copper, iron, and sulfur. Those are minerals that you can just crack open the ground and you can see them. And um, so what are minerals? They're what the rocks are made out of. All right, and we're going to talk more about this in some activities during class. So we need to be able to identify rocks, and more specifically, we need to be able to identify the minerals that compose those rocks. And we've got this list here. Now, you're not going to ever be asked to come up with this list, but you are going to have to be able to describe each test, um, these seven tests or eight tests that are listed here. No, seven, yeah. Seven tests that are listed here. You're going to have to be able to describe each test, and um, we're going to do a lab in which you're going to practice using each of these tests. So the first one is crystal form. So we kind of look at a mineral and we see what shape does that mineral like to take. So you got that beautiful pentagon with the quartz. That is so emblematic. Um, every time you go see quartz in a, in a jewelry store or anything like that, you're always going to see these beautiful shapes that it makes. And then we've got pyrite, which kind of looks like gold, doesn't it? And in fact, this is called fool's gold. Sometimes when you're digging in the earth, you will come across pyrite and um, lots and lots of people have seen it. They bought the land thinking they're going to make a ton of money on the gold mine, and then they start harvesting it, and it's just pyrite, which is not very valuable. It's more common than gold. So anyway, the shapes that these different minerals make help us to identify them. So you see how this pyrite has these kind of cubical um, shapes with the lines. Real gold doesn't do that. So what we've got here is we've got a nice way of telling, oh, is that real gold or is that fool's gold? And so that's what we're using our crystal form to do. 
Um, other minerals have really tight spaces. Others are, are really distorted. Some are really ordered. Some seem kind of random, but they all do have these um, crystal forms that are repeating structures that you can really tell. So, oh man, asbestos. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, so asbestos is a, a fireproof mineral that um, was used often in homes and things like that in order to make it fireproof and then we found out that it causes really bad health effects and now it's illegal to use in, in most of the country. But you can see the crystal form here with those long spindly threads that go up and down in the rock and um, so that's you know we're just using the form of the crystal in order to identify what kind of rock it is. Alright, uh, some crystals have more than one kind of form. The most common one to talk about is diamonds and graphite. So the thing that's in your pencil is made out of the exact same stuff, pure carbon, as the stuff that's in your diamond ring. How can that be? Well, they're just oriented differently. The little atoms are oriented differently. And in carbon, in carbon graphite, you've got sheets of slick carbon atoms. And that's why it writes so easy, because you're taking off one sheet at a time as you write across. The diamond, on the other hand, is a much more complicated structure where all the carbons have multiple bonds and it's really three-dimensional, and that's why it's so hard. And we're actually going to find out it's one of the hardest things around. Well, speaking of hardness, here we go. Um, you guys have all heard of the Mohs hardness scale. You've heard about this from middle school, and um, we're just going to kind of review it here. On the right, you'll see that there's several different rocks, and they've each been assigned a number. These rocks are considered the standards for different hardness levels. So you see 10 diamond on the right. Diamond is one of the hardest minerals out there. Um, there's a little bit of debate if there are other minerals that are more hard than diamond, and um, that is a great project if you guys like to look into that. And then you see all these different standards. And so what do we mean? We mean we take two rocks and we scratch them together, and we see which one kind of which one was scratched and which one did the scratching. So if you took something like Appetite, which is number five, and you took something like Gypsum, which is number two, and you took Appetite and Gypsum, you scratched them together, well, you would expect the Appetite to kind of carve a ridge into the Gypsum. The Appetite would be harder than the Gypsum, and the Gypsum would be scratched by the Appetite. And um, this the, the, the Mohs hardness scale is a really great way to identify minerals because you could say, oh, well, I think it really looks like quartz, but it turns out that it's softer than apatite, so it can't be quartz. And so this is one of our um, identifying mineral tests that we use. And, you know, at the heart of this, the reason why things are hard and other things are soft, it's just all about the chemistry. And so get really excited about high school chemistry, and maybe I'll see you in that class too. All right, um, our next test is cleavage and fracture. So cleavage is when something breaks off in sheets or it breaks along a plane of weakness. Now that sounds a little bit complicated, but the best example of this I can think of is chopping wood. If you guys have ever watched someone chop wood or done it yourself, you'll notice that if you hit it just in the right spot, the wood will just split. And you don't even have to bring the ax all the way through the wood. It'll just poof, pop apart and it'll follow that grain of the wood. Now that's cleavage, when, when a mineral breaks along a line that was already inside the mineral. But then fracture is just busting it up, right? That's like take a hammer to it and it just pff, breaks. And it's not breaking along any beautiful lines, it's just breaking. And some rocks cleave really easily, right? Some rocks really, you just take them, you hit them on the ground, and a sheet of the rock will fall off. Other rocks break more irregularly. And using that test, we can tell which rock we're holding, which minerals are the components of that rock. And then we've got luster. This is one of our, I think this might be our last test. Um, this is just shininess, and you can get a little bit more specific than just saying shiny. We can say, oh, it's metallic, oh, it's greasy, and we're going to have, in our lab, we're going to practice with these terms, and we're going to get better at it. All right, now, color and streak. Now, these are very similar. Color is just the color of the rock, right? You look at it and say, oh, this, this rock is black or this rock is red. Um, that's pretty easy, but it's not a reliable indicator of the mineral and because the, there's lots of minerals that are the same color, especially black, especially white. There's lots and lots of minerals that are really just the same color. A better, more reliable form is streak. So you take something like 
hematite, which is in the picture. And if you look at it, it looks kind of dark. It looks dark, kind of like a black. But if you take that and you streak it across a harder, whiter um, rock, like maybe marble or something like that, it'll leave behind some finer dust of the rock. And that finer dust of the rock allows you to get to see the color in a little bit better resolution. So you'll be able to see, oh, I couldn't see the red before, or I couldn't see the green before, but now I see it. Um, and streak is one of those really helpful methods. Now, um, because all minerals have different chemical compositions, they're all going to have different colors. And so this is one of our useful tools to do it. All right, and then we've got specific gravity. Now, specific gravity is more of a, just a special geologist term that means density. How heavy is the rock? I think we all know that sometimes you pick up rocks and you think to yourself, oh, like this rock is a lot lighter than I thought it was, or oh, this rock is a lot heavier than I thought it was. And that lets you know about what the composition of that rock is. Is the rock full of atoms that are really tightly packed together with really short chemical bonds, or does it have a lot of holes in it, or are the bonds really spread out? Um, and so one of the ways that we can... Um, use specific, density, specific gravity in order to um, do work is the panhandler that's here pictured on the left. So we've got this pioneer, he's looking for gold, he puts his pan into the um, river and he scoops up a bunch of rock. Well, he's going to shake that rock and the light rocks are going to fly out of the pan, but the heavy rocks are going to stay in the pan. He keeps shaking it. Well, what's going to happen is the heaviest rock is going to be the last one to leave the pan. And it turns out that gold is one of the heaviest rocks, or heaviest minerals. And so as he's shaking it, his idea is, I'm going to shake it and shake it, and the last thing to leave my pan, the last thing in my pan will be gold. And this is how lots of prospectors went out and they found gold. So you get in the river, you do that a few times, you find some gold, and you know, oh, we should build a gold mine near here. We can extract a lot of gold from this area. All right, and then we've got the chemical properties. So, so far we've just been dealing with physical properties, but these are chemical properties. Um, one of them that you might be surprised to hear about is the taste test. Geologists like to put their mouths on things, and we're going to practice this a little bit in our rock lab. And one mineral is salt, but in geology we call it halite. A lot of the salt that you eat is actually dug up from the ground. They dig down, they get mines, and there are old oceans or old seas that have been dried up and they leave behind lots of salt. Well, you can go in there and you can just harvest that salt and then put it on your french fries. And we actually have a sample that we're going to pass around sometime this week. Um, another test that we can do is the fizz test. So certain, certain um, minerals will react to acids. And so one thing we like to do is we like to bring some HCl, hydrochloric acid, and we drop it onto the mineral. We see if we see bubbles. Those bubbles are when the HCl reacts with the carbonates in the, um, in the mineral, and they give off CO2. And that's the same CO2 that comes off of your soda, right? Because your soda is really acidic, and there's some carbonates in there, and so the CO2 leaves. And so we can see... Um, the fizz test, we can use the fizz test in order to see if there are carbonates in our rock, and that'll help us identify which mineral. All right, um, from this lesson, uh, hopefully you guys remember the discussion we had of basalt and granite. Now those are igneous rocks. You guys should know sandstone and limestone, those are sedimentary rocks, and marble and slate, those are gonna be our um, premier metamorphic rocks. So this is one of the takeaways we're gonna take from this lesson.